Hello, fellow neuroscience enthusiasts. This video is another installment of the Brain Preservation Foundation's Neuroscience Journal Club, in which we briefly review the results of a selected paper and discuss its relevance to the ongoing debate regarding brain preservation. Today's paper is entitled Locally Coordinated Synaptic Plasticity of Visual Cortex Neurons in Vivo by El Bastani et al. It was published in the journal Science on June 22, 2018. A link to the paper is listed below. This is a truly fantastic paper. The paper offers one of the most direct tests I have ever seen of the textbook theories about how learning occurs in the brain. The authors induce learning in a single visual neuron, a layer 2-3 pyramidal cell in mouse V1, using well-timed optogenetic stimulation. Using this method, they literally shift the visual receptive field location of that neuron. Using fluorescence imaging, they see that some of the neuron's dendritic spine synapses grow, while others shrink in response to this learning paradigm. And using calcium imaging, they measure the receptive field properties not only of the neuron itself, but of its individual dendritic spiny synapses. Since the receptive field properties of a spiny synapse is related to the axonal input it receives, the authors essentially know what information each synapse is providing to that neuron. And they find, exactly as textbook models would predict, that the synapses that increased in size following the learning paradigm were precisely those whose receptive field locations overlapped with the target location to be learned. This is a direct confirmation that dendritic spine size encodes functional learning of receptive field properties. Really exciting stuff. Unfortunately, I will only be able to cover a fraction of what is in this paper, so please do try to read the full paper yourself. Also, please note that although I will try my best to accurately relate the research, it is always possible that I may misinterpret something crucial. If I do, please let me know in the comments and I will try to correct it. This paper is just one of a plethora of papers we will be covering that seek to determine how learning and memories are physically stored in the brain. Now on to the details of the paper. First, the researchers performed whole cell recordings in mouse visual cortex. To do this, they used a patch pipette to voltage clamp the neuron so that they could precisely measure the sum of excitatory currents coming in to that cell from its synapses. They presented the mouse with a screen upon which white squares were flashed. Each square was 12 degrees of visual angle and width, and they were presented at locations comprising a 5 by 4 grid as shown here. The white square stimuli were presented for one second each, interspersed with half-second blanks, like this. By averaging the excitatory synaptic current response of the cell to squares presented at each of the 20 screen locations, they were able to determine the visual receptive field of the cell. For example, this shows that the cell gave a large response when a square was flashed at this location. And this shows that the cell gave a small response when a square is flashed at this location. This plot displays how the cell responded to each of the 20 locations, making clear that this cell, uh, in particular, responds best to flashes in this general area of the screen. I should note here that since this is a V1 layer 2-3 pyramidal cell, it is likely to be tuned to more complex features than simple flashes in a part of the visual field. For example, it may respond to oriented edges best. But this possibility is ignored in this experiment in favor of using simpler flashed square stimuli. This bottom plot shows the timing of the cell's current response. As a side note here, the units plotted here are z-scores, which is why it looks inverted from the other plots. Zooming in on this response timing, what we 
need to understand is that there is a large excitatory postsynaptic current going into the cell, which peaks around 100 milliseconds after the square is flashed on. This is important because in later experiments, the authors time an optogenetic stimulation to occur precisely 50 milliseconds later. In those later experiments, the cell is not voltage clamped, i.e. it is free to fire action potentials, and this optogenetic stimulation will cause the cell to fire an action potential at precisely 150 milliseconds after the square is flashed. This timing is set to maximize the spike time dependent plasticity that will be induced in all synapses that were activated to that flash. Having gained this timing information, the authors then performed a separate experiment designed to induce learning in a visual neuron. First, they used single cell electroporation, shown here, to inject DNA constructs for the following. The calcium indicator GCAMP6, which allows activity recording of both the cell soma and individual dendritic spines, as we'll see later. The opsin, uh, channel rhodopsin, which will allow optogenetic activation of the cell via a flash of blue light delivered by an optic fiber. And it's important to note that both of these constructs produce fluorescent proteins, uh, mRuby and mCherry, which allow the cell's morphology to be seen. This will allow them to uh, see the fine details of the sizes of dendritic spines. The learning paradigm was as follows. First, the GCAMP calcium signal at the cell body, i.e. its soma, was recorded while the mouse watched randomly flashing white squares on the screen. This was used to determine the naive receptive field of the neuron soma. This pre-learning receptive field location is depicted here. A target location depicted here as a red X was then chosen 12 degrees of visual angle away. This is the location that the learning paradigm will attempt to shift the cell's receptive field to. Now this here is a depiction of the learning paradigm itself. Every time the white square is presented at the target location, the neuron is hit with a burst of blue light, causing it to fire. The researchers performed this pairing a total of 60 times, interspersed with flashing of other squares at other locations, but without optogenetic stimulation. The idea behind this is to cause long-term potentiation in precisely those synapses onto this cell that are activated by the square flashing at the target location. This reasoning is presented here. The neuron receives synaptic inputs labeled S1, S2, S3, S4 from many upstream visual neurons, neurons that are closer to the retina. Each of these upstream neurons has its own receptive field tuning and its synapses inherit the receptive field tuning of those upstream neurons. A key assumption in modern neuroscience is that the target neuron's receptive field will be determined by a weighted summation of its synaptic inputs receptive fields. Here we see that the synapse S3 has a receptive field located near the location of the cell's receptive field. So we would expect that the synapse S3 is relatively strong. This is depicted here as a larger dendritic spine relative to the others. By optogenetically stimulating the cell every time a square is flashed at the target location, LTP is induced on those synapses coming from upstream cells with receptive fields in the target region. In this depiction, the synapses S1 and S2 have receptive fields at the target location. These inject their currents just before the optogenetic stimulation, resulting in maximal spike time dependent plasticity at those synapses only. The result after 60 pairings is an increase in strength and size 
of synapses S1 and synapse S2. And because a neuron tries to keep its weights balanced by something called homeostatic plasticity, there is a decrease in the S3 synapse. The result is a shift of the cell's receptive field away from where it was originally toward the target location. This optogenetic learning paradigm did indeed succeed in shifting the receptive field of the neuron toward the target location, as these plots from the paper show. Figure K shows the pre-training and post-training measured receptive field of a single example neuron. You can clearly see that the peak response, shown in yellow, has shifted toward the target location after learning. Figure L shows the results from 22 separate learning experiments, the black dots, and the results from 21 separate control experiments that didn't undergo any optogenetic learning. It shows that the optogenetic learning paradigm typically succeeds in shifting the cell's receptive field in the direction of the target. To make this a little more clear and to set us up for future experiments, Let's review this quickly using some new animations. Many upstream visual neurons exist, which have a range of receptive field tunings. These cells project axons into the region of our target cell. Our target cell can send dendritic spines out to make contacts with any of these axons. And over childhood of this animal, a particular pattern of synaptic strengths have been formed with these input axons. Whenever a square is flashed here, this upstream cell will fire sending an action potential down its axon. And because this is a large synapse, this will cause our downstream cell to fire. Now, of course, this animation is a drastic oversimplification. The real cell would have on the order of 10,000 spiny synapses and would have uh, to have many of those activated to cause the downstream cell to fire. But this simplified drawing should make clear the main point, that the receptive field of the downstream cell is determined by which upstream cells it receives strong synapses from. This particular arrangement shown here of synaptic strengths would suggest that the receptive field of this downstream cell is as shown here. Now, during learning, whenever this square is flashed, our target cell is caused to fire immediately after via an optogenetic flash. This is the target location that we're trying to get the cell to uh, move its receptive field to. This causes a voltage spike in the dendritic uh, uh, length, leading to LTP at this synapse. With repeated pairings, this synapse grows in strength and size, while other synapses shrink to compensate. The result is that the neuron's receptive field has shifted to the target location. Now, in an actual experiment, you cannot see the axons. You can only see the target cell because it alone has been electroporated to express fluorescent proteins. And you can zoom in on a dendritic branch to clearly see the individual dendritic spiny synapses. This figure from the paper zooms in on one dendritic branch during a learning experiment and tracks it before the learning occurs and at 30 minute intervals after learning has occurred. You can see that this synapse, pointed to by red arrow, started off small, but grew larger immediately after the learning paradigm, labeled zero minutes here. And it retained this larger size even 150 minutes after learning. In contrast, this synapse, pointed to by the green arrow, retained its size initially, but by the 150 minute mark had shrunken significantly. The authors show that 
larger changes in the volumes of dendritic spines, both increases and decreases, occur during learning than during matched controls without learning. And they show that the increase in spine volumes happens almost immediately. But the compensatory shrinkage of other spines occurs more slowly over about two hours. This alone is a significant finding regarding the time course of LTP versus homeostatic uh, synaptic plasticity. This important finding certainly deserves more explanation, but I want to move on to the key result now. In my opinion, the key result of this paper is the demonstration that those synapses that grow in size during the learning paradigm are the same synapses that have receptive fields that overlap with the target location to be learned. Of course, this is exactly what the textbook models of learning would suggest, but demonstrating that functional learning is mirrored so closely by a structural change in specific dendritic spines is a key milestone in proving that these textbook models of learning are correct. Shown here is the circuit before learning, and this is after learning. This synapse has grown in size, and its receptive field overlaps with the cell's newly learned receptive field location. But again, we can't see the axons in the real experiment. But the experiments, experimenters could use GCAMP6 imaging to measure the receptive field properties of each individual synapse along the dendrite. In essence, they measure that this synapse had this receptive field, and this synapse had this receptive field, this synapse had this receptive field, and this synapse had this receptive field. Not only that, they knew that this synapse grew during learning, and this synapse shrunk during learning, and that learning resulted in the cell's receptive field shifting as shown. Taken together, these structural changes directly explain the functional learning that has occurred. Now, here are the data from the paper that actually demonstrate this. This is a picture of a target neuron undergoing learning. The orange rectangle is zooming in on a dendritic branch that was imaged during the training. Here is that dendritic branch zoomed in. GCAMP6 imaging, calcium imaging, was performed while the mouse was presented the flashing square stimuli so that the receptive fields of the neuron itself along with its synapses, each of its synapses receptive fields could be determined. Here are the calcium imaging traces for the dendritic branch, the synapse labeled number one in the image here, and for the synapse labeled number two. Now, after analyzing the calcium signal for synapse number one, its receptive field could be determined. Now, the, this is a, uh, a graph that is showing uh, for each of the 20 flashing square locations that the mouse is seeing, uh, how that particular synapse responded. And you can see that that particular synapse responds most strongly for squares that are flashed toward the right side of the screen. Now, this is the receptive field that has been determined for synapse number two. And you can see that it responds most strongly to uh, a flashing square on its top left, in the top left of the visual field. You can see that even though these two dendritic spine synapses are part of the very same neuron, their calcium signals show quite different feature selectivity. And this is because the, the dendritic spines, having small necks and bulbous heads, uh, act as somewhat independent compartments, able to uh, have independent calcium concentration relative to, their, uh, to their, uh, the cell they're attached to, and to track the axonal input 
features selectivity as opposed to tracking uh, the, uh, the cell body's uh, feature selectivity. I will point interested viewers toward Raphael Yuste's book, uh, shown here, which has an excellent in-depth discussion of the spine electrophysiology and how they can act as somewhat independent compartments injecting current into their parent cells. The authors found synapses that either clearly grew during learning or that clearly shrank during learning. The synapse labeled one here clearly grew in size from pre-learning to post-learning. This growth of synapse one is quantified in this plot showing fluorescence intensity of the spine relative to the dendritic shaft. And the synapse labeled number two here clearly shrank from the pre-learning to the post-learning. This shrinkage of synapse two is quantified in this plot. Now, if we look at the peak receptive field response of synapse number one, we see that its receptive field location, the yellow square here, is aligned with the learning target's location, the red X. This is the key result, really. The synapse that grew was the one that had a receptive field that overlapped with the learning target. In contrast, if we look at the peak receptive field response of synapse number two, we see that its receptive field location is not aligned with the learning target's location. The synapse that shrank was one that was not needed for the target learning location. The authors performed this type of analysis on a total of 94 spines that grew in size, i.e. that underwent LTP, and 87 spines that shrank, i.e. that underwent LTD, long-term depression. And they found that synapses that underwent LTP were typically those whose receptive fields were close to the learning target, that is, Synapses whose receptive fields were closer to the learning target were significantly more likely to grow in size than those whose receptive fields were further away. I hope you agree with me that this is a truly fantastic paper. And if you haven't already, I really hope that you take the opportunity to give it a read yourself. My hat's off to the, to the authors. In, in summary, this paper offered a direct confirmation that dendritic spine size encodes functional learning of receptive field properties in visual neurons. Now let me very briefly address the relevance of this particular paper to the ongoing brain preservation debate. Some of the objections I commonly hear against brain preservation are that we have no idea how learning is encoded in the brain. And there's no reason to believe that structural connectome preservation would be sufficient to allow the decoding of neuronal receptive field properties. Well, this El Bastani et al. 2018 paper that we've just gone over demonstrated that we, the neuroscience community, at least understand learning sufficiently well to induce a cell's receptive field to change in a manner we prescribe by using appropriately timed optogenetic stimulation. In my opinion, this is pretty significant evidence in favor of today's spike time dependent plasticity uh, model of learning. And this paper goes on to demonstrate that such learning produces easily visible structural changes, i.e. Uh, dendritic spine enlargement, in a particular subset of dendritic spiny synapses, precisely those synapses coming from upstream neurons whose own receptive field properties uh, can be summed to produce the targeted learning. In my opinion, this at least suggests that it might be possible to someday decode the receptive field properties of cells in a glutaraldehyde-preserved brain based on a complete connectomic mapping of the connections those cells are receiving from upstream neurons all the way out to the sensory periphery.
Now I hear someone out there objecting that the Elbastani et al. results only showed structural plasticity of dendritic spines in the living brain by imaging with two-photon microscopy. How do we know that these same structural changes that correlate so well with learning in vivo can be preserved, for example, by aldehyde-stabilized carb preservation, which necessitates the use of glutaraldehyde fixation of the brain? Well, it turns out that the authors actually produced results that even address this question. This is a two-photon image of a dendritic segment from the experiment uh, taken while the mouse was alive prior to learning. And this is the same dendrite taken immediately after learning. Uh, as described previously, these were the types of images that showed uh, structural changes of dendritic spines during learning in the living animal. Now, once the learning experiment was completed, the mouse here was immediately sacrificed and perfused with a buffered mixture of glutaraldehyde and paraformaldehyde. Then the authors painstakingly found the same region of the brain that contained this dendrite. They marked it and prepared a block of tissue containing it for 3D electron microscopy using the zero block face SEM approach to 3D electron microscopy. And here is that same dendrite reconstructed from those serial electron micrographs. The numbers next to the synapses in this EM image correspond to the same synapses in the two photon images of the living brain. So this is a direct comparison between the, uh, the structure in the living brain as it was imaged while the mouse was performing this task directly compared to the electron micrographs of that brain that has been preserved with glutaraldehyde fixation and put through further steps for uh, electron micrograph imaging. And these are the same synapses that you can find in both of these. This is synapse number one in the light micrograph versus synapse number one in the electron micrograph. Synapse number two in the light micrograph versus synapse number two in the electron micrograph. Synapse number three versus synapse number three. Uh, it's, it's, it's fascinating to look at the differences in shapes here between the two, uh, but you should remember that the uh, light micrograph image is actually very close to the resolution of the light microscope, and it is a fluorescence image, whereas the electron micrograph image here is really a reconstruction based upon the uh, cell membrane uh, that is uh, defining these dendritic spines. Now, this scatter plot compares from the paper, compares the size of each synapse in the light micrograph versus that synapse in the electron uh, micrograph reconstruction. The black dots are the ones to look at. Those are the ones after the learning has occurred and uh, uh, the mouse was sacrificed immediately after that. And what you can see from this graph is that the sizes measured in the living brain by two photon microscopy correlate well with the sizes measured uh, from the EM reconstruction of the brain tissue. What I mean by that is that Lar if a synapse is relatively large in the two-photon micrograph of the living brain, it is also relatively large in the uh, electron micrographic reconstruction. They also compared the uh, electron microscopy measured spine volume with the EM measured postsynaptic density area where the receptor proteins reside. And again, they found a good correlation which is something we covered in more detail in one of our previous neuroscience journal clubs. So in summary, these results, in my humble opinion, offer additional evidence that the methods for brain preservation that exist today already have a reasonable chance of preserving much of the learned information content of a brain. 
and they offer a glimpse at the technologies that would be needed to decode such preserved information in the far future. These journal clubs are designed to provoke discussion and debate about this topic, specifically within the neuroscience community. So if you have a scientific objection, please do make a comment below the video or reach out to me directly. And feel free to share this and other of our videos with other scientists who may be interested in debating the topic on scientific grounds. And as always, thank you very much for listening and thank you for keeping an open mind regarding what advances in neuroscience might bring in the far future.